I'm very happy now to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Stephen Taylor, who's a professor with the UBC Department of Psychiatry and the author of more than 300 scientific publications and 20 books. He released his most recent book, The Psychology of Pandemics, Preparing for the Next Global Outbreak of Infectious Disease, just a few weeks before the COVID-19 outbreak. Dr. Taylor is also a member of the Canadian Federal Government Expect Expert Advisory Panel on COVID-19. I'm now very pleased to turn things over to Dr. Taylor. Uh, thanks very much, Marge, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me here. Um, let me see if I can get this share screen to work. Um, so can everyone see that the- um, That's good. Yeah. Thank you. So my understanding is I'm talking for about 30 minutes and we'll open it up for comments and questions and so forth. Um, so yeah, I knew a pandemic was coming. I just didn't think it would be so soon after the publication of this book. Uh, we use this book as a foundation for um, continuing our research into the psychology of pandemics during COVID-19. So um, unlike many labs across campus, which were closed down through much of 2020, we were up and running in early 2020, collecting uh, internet-based data on large samples of adults from Canada and the United States in attempt to better understand the, the, um, the psychology of pandemics, particularly the psychology of COVID-19. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about, I want to talk about the importance of psychological factors in pandemics. Uh, when I started working on the book in 2018, um, most of my friends thought I was, I was mad because I'd be going around telling them that these pandemics, psychology is hugely important. And my friends would say to me, well, you know, so pandemics are just about some microbe going viral. That's all there is to it. Well, as you probably know now, having lived through COVID-19, psychology is hugely important in understanding and, and mitigating pandemics. Um, I want to talk a bit about <clears throat> similarities between COVID-19 and past pandemics to try and help put COVID in context. Some noteworthy differences, some recent advances in the psychology of pandemics, talk a bit about mental health resources and life in a post-pandemic world. I'd like to um, talk a bit about that and what that might look like. If you look at the methods for managing pandemics, psychology is hugely important. The methods involve trustworthy communication from health authorities, agreeing to uh, engage in hygiene practices, social distancing, vaccination, and so forth. So all these methods, they require that people believe what the health authorities have to say. You just froze there for a second, Dr. Taylor. ones to COVID and disorders that are worsened um, by the pandemic, pre-existing disorders. An example there would be obsessive compulsive disorder with contamination, obsessions and hand-washing compulsions worsened during COVID-19, which has been well documented. Um, huge number of stresses. Uh, one that is important is Uncertainty is a pervasive abstract stressor during pandemics. Uncertainty as to how bad it will be, whether or not it will become a pandemic, what you do to keep yourself safe, uh, when will it be over, and those sorts of things. So lots, so people who have a great deal of difficulty life, you're going to worry a great deal. And so for these people who are having difficulty tolerating uncertainty, they're having a particularly different, difficult time during this pandemic. And such individuals are prone to um, anxiety disorders, such as generalized anxiety disorder. Other, the obvious stresses. Um, when it comes to pandemics, it's the social lockdowns or the restrictions that have the main big impact on people's mental health. Um, 
I'm going to touch on that in a second. Social restrictions are like a necessary evil. They're like the chemotherapy for treating the COVID cancer. And that chemotherapy makes people emotionally sick. And so we've seen a progressive decline in people's mental health over the past 12 months or so. And that's largely linked to the social restrictions. Nothing we can do about it. It's a necessary evil. If you look at the alternatives, which we'll touch on in a sec, they're just untenable. The alternatives are no social restrictions and widespread death. Socioeconomic costs are huge, disruption in social rituals. This is a subtle and important stressor, rituals of not being able to attend funerals or weddings or graduation parties, which uh, upends people's lives. And of course, the disruptions in work and school, which many of you have experienced anyway. You probably know what it's like to be in situations like this, where you're trying to work from home while trying to care for young children, highly stressful. Psychological reactions to pandemics. Uh, in an important way, the psychological footprint is bigger than the medical footprint. And by that, I mean that more people are afflicted psychologically than they are through actual infections. Um, it's just the way pandemics work. For example, if you look at the recent data from the United States, one out of every three Americans knows someone who has died of COVID-19. So the number of people who know people who have been bereaved by people who suffered from COVID exceeds the actual number of COVID deaths. Or go back to say, uh, middle of last year when we were doing research. At that time, there were only about 2% of participants in our survey of about 7,000 people. 2% had been infected with COVID versus 20 to 25% were suffering from anxiety and depression around COVID. So that's what I mean by the psychological impact is big. There are Overreactors and underreactors to COVID related stress, which I want to emphasize in a, in a bit. Excessive health anxiety, post traumatic stress disorder, bereavement, depression, and so forth. So they're the psychological reactions. And I should also mention pandemics are dynamic events. People's anxiety or distress levels rise and fall. So when there are threats of lockdown, people's anxiety go up and there, there's panic buying and so forth. And when lockdowns are are released, people's moods tend to improve. Compared to past pandemics, there are lots and lots of similarities. There are the under and overreactors, the people, the underreactors are the people who aren't taking it seriously. The overreactors are the ones who develop excessive anxiety. Uh, there's the rise of racism and other xenophobia, unfortunately a feature of all the past pandemics that, that I've studied. Quack cures and profiteering, panic buying, fear and avoidance of healthcare workers. So that stigmatization, unfortunately, uh, is a feature of pandemics. The rise of altruism, but also rumors and conspiracy theories, mask rebellion, vax hesitancy, all seen in past outbreaks and pandemics. An interesting one is the effects on art, culture and society, which is inconsistent. Many previous outbreaks have had those effects um, uh, we will see them from COVID-19, for example, the acceleration of trends that are already in place, such as the trend to work from home. But often these are subtle and, and difficult to, to detect the effects on art, culture and society until many years later on. There are some important differences. Oh, this is a plague doctor uh, from, this is personal protective equipment circa 1650. The plague doctor, he would go from town to town inspecting people who were, who were quarantined in their houses because they'd acquired bubonic plague. The plague doctor here is equipped with his trusty stick because there was nothing much a plague doctor could do but go around counting up the number of dead. So prod those people to see if they're still alive. Plague doctor has his trusty gloves and this headgear with the protective eyewear. And you'll notice the characteristic beak. The beak was actually full of aromatic herbs. And this has to do with beliefs about the causes of infection. Um, if you go back, say, prior to the 1890s, well, let's take the Russian flu pandemic of 1889, there, a prevailing belief, it was before germ theory had really taken hold, it was a belief in miasma, the belief that bad air caused infection. So our plague doctor has this special beak with aromatic herbs to try and battle the miasma. 
And so beliefs are hugely important. If you go back to the Russian flu pandemic, people weren't wearing masks, they weren't in lockdown. In fact, what they were doing is uh, huddling in their little stuffy rooms with the windows closed, worried about the bad night air coming in, the mists and so forth, thinking that that got them infected. Social media is a huge difference between COVID and past pandemics, as is the 24-7 news cycle and the so-called infodemic. We're bombarded with information uh, that's either true, false, or somewhere in between about the pandemic, which can be confusing for people. Um, we've benefited from some lessons of the past. You don't name pandemics after people, places, or things. You don't call COVID-19 Wuhan flu or the Chinese virus because that uh, propagates racism. One of the things, the big differences between COVID and past pandemics is the rapidly evolving views on COVID-19, which is confusing people. And this is because of the rapid um, progress in research. So if you go back to early 2020, the WHO were telling us for various reasons, don't wear a mask. And now they've completely changed their tune and making masks mandatory. That reflects the evolving science, but that can be confusing to the public. Back in 2020, early on, we were told that, oh, you better clean surfaces because that's how you get sick. Well, it turned out to be wrong. And so people referred to this, this emphasis on cleaning. And you'll see it if you walk into stores or restaurants um, or so forth, people diligently cleaning the touch screens on the cash register. That's been dubbed hygiene theater because it provides people with a false sense of security. You're more likely to get infected by um, aerosols or, or, or water droplets from people coughing than from touching surfaces. So that's just another way in which our knowledge of COVID-19 has been rapidly evolving over time. Some other important differences, um, Spanish flu of 18, uh, 1918, when you were in lockdown, you were in lockdown. There was no Snapchat, there was no Netflix. And if you got sick and you developed pneumonia, you died. There were no ventilators back then. And in the Spanish flu, many people died not from the influenza, but from secondary pneumonia, uh, which was important back then. Of course, the difference between then, today and then is back then they had rapidly produced vaccines just like we have, but their vaccines were based on a misconception. They thought the Spanish flu was caused by a bacterium. Uh, Pfeiffer's bacillus, for example. And so their vaccines were anti antibacterial. They weren't antiviral. Uh, uh, however, those vaccines might have been useful in treating the secondary pneumonia. So there's some differences. The Russian flu pandemic, as I mentioned, no masks, no lockdowns, no social distancing. The, the virus essentially burned its way through communities, uh, eventually establishing um, herd immunity. Now, this is similar to something that was proposed in 2020 called the Great Barrington Declaration. It was this idea that you, that you eliminate social distancing and lockdown except for the uh, vulnerable individuals. So this declaration was arguing, oh, let's just put the old people into seclusion and let young people run wild and let the virus burn its way through the community. Uh, highly controversial declaration. Um, and some people think that this is barbaric because it's going to inflate the mortality rate. But differences in approaches. Um, if you go back to the plague of Athens in 430 BC, and this is another big difference, which gives us reason for hope during COVID-19. If you read the descriptions back then, it was a sense of fatalism, helplessness, hopelessness, and despair, the sense that there was nothing they could do. So here's... Um, uh, through Psychides, Psychides uh, his description. He said, the most terrible thing was the despair into which people fell when they realized they'd caught the plague. It thought it might have been typhus or um, smallpox. But they would immediately adopt the attitude of utter help, hopelessness and by giving in in this way would lose their powers of resistance. Very different from today where we've, we've got lots of tools for keeping people safe and despite the pandemic fatigue that we're experiencing and the low grade depression that many people are encountering, there's still that optimism. We still hear people talking about uh, 
um, plagues. Just to zoom in a bit, a look at pandemic related psychological phenomena. For the most part, just about everything we're seeing in COVID-19 has been uh, seen before, but uh, in COVID is just more of it and it's faster. So quack, oh, folk cures, Spanish flu, 1819, eating onions to keep yourself safe. 2020, people were boiling tea infused with garlic water with the mistaken idea it would keep them safe. Quack cures in 1918, plenty of quack cures today in 2020, 2021. Desperate measures. Somehow I just got muted. I hope I'm unmuted now. Uh, yeah, somehow people reason that, oh, hydrogen peroxide kills germs, so therefore if I drink it, it must keep me safe. Bad, bad, bad idea. 2020, there's been something similar, people dying from drinking hand sanitizer. Profiteering, eat more candy, have less flu, protection caps. 1918, McGregor's final scotch, a real tonic for the flu. 2020, Coca-Cola put this sign up in Times Square, trying to pair the drinking of Coke with staying safe. Again, profiteering. Super spreading. Now, uh, you can distinguish between super spreaders individuals who shed virus like typhoid, so-called typhoid Mary. Um, and they have been documented during COVID-19, but not to the extent as in past pandemics. What we're seeing more often today are super spreading events, like people crowding into bars and restaurants or parties as a way of spreading infection. Um, we've been doing research, as I mentioned, into um, COVID-19, the psychology of it, and we've been looking at the extremes. We know from past research that most people are resilient to stress. Although you might be feeling anxious or bummed out or dysphoric now, most of you will bounce back from this. But we're looking at the extremes. We're finding evidence for a COVID stress syndrome, people at the extreme who are highly stressed out about COVID and a COVID disregard syndrome. And by syndrome, I mean a constellation of attitudes and behaviors that hang together. Um, so the syndrome in seeking reassurance. So they're spending a lot of time on the internet searching for information about COVID. And in part, that's probably giving them nightmares. an excessive anxiety response to COVID that we hope in most cases will abate once the pandemic is over. Although for some individuals, this will become a chronic persistent problem. Flip that around to the other extreme, the COVID disregard syndrome. These people who think, these are people who think that COVID is no big deal. They think social distancing is unnecessary. They're, they're not concerned about getting infected. They tend to have poor hygiene, they tend to be anti-vax, anti-lockdown. These people are important to reach because these are the people spreading infection. And it's not just young people. These are people of all demographic groups. We've been trying to understand the complexities of pandemics. And one thing I hope people will realize after this presentation is that pandemics at a psychological level are hugely complicated phenomena. And I'm not gonna talk about this, but we've been running a series of network analyses to try and understand how all of these pieces are tied in together. So it's more than one or two variables. It's more than just people thinking it's, it's exaggerated or people getting anxious. It's a whole network of things being linked together. Again, I'll, this is not the venue to talk about this will take too long. Um, panic buying is not new either. 1918, there was panic buying of supplies from pharmacy stores. For example, um, Vicks Vapor Rub, which is a mentholated ointment you can rub on your chest that makes breathing easier. Panic buying of that. 2020, you're all familiar with panic buying of toilet paper. If you live in Vancouver, like I do, there's been panic buying of cannabis. And of course, if you live in the United States, it's panic buying of guns and ammo. So panic buying is often triggered by threats of lockdown. It will regularly precipitate a bout of, of panic buying. It has snowballing effects. People's behavior is driven by the behavior of their fellow shoppers. And um, often it's the highly anxious people who get in there first panic buying 
who are terrified about the uncertainties of lockdown. Other shoppers see them anxiously buying and it's, it's goal contagion. Um, a little bit like game theory. If, if I see you panic buying, if you're buying up all the toilet paper and I'm in the store, I think, well, wow, I better start buying it or there'll be none left for me. So goal contagion. There are other things too. There are people with dark personality traits. And by that, I mean people who are Machiavellian, psychopathic, who like to exploit other people. They've been also getting in on this panic buying, not because they're anxious, because they're buying up stuff to sell it as a profit. And there've been cases where people have been panic buying or hoarding supplies of, of, of hand sanitizer or Purell, hoping to sell it at a profit. So this is panic buying, not driven out of fear, but during, driven out of a, a desire to exploit the situation. And of course, the folly of don't panic messages. How many times have we seen our, our political leaders get in and scream out in frustration, don't panic, we have enough toilet paper. Well, that message just fuels things. It makes things worse. It makes people worry that there is something to panic about. Here's the best strategy for dealing with panic buying. Oops. Um, if you hear about an episode of panic buying breaking out, most people think, oh, I better rush to the store to get ahead of the crowd. Well, that line of thinking will put you in the middle of the crowd because everyone is thinking the same thing. If you hear about, if let's say Vancouver's going into lockdown and you know there's going to be more panic buying, if you can, wait a week because episodes of panic buying last about a week. If you can hold off for a week, when you get to the store, the crowds will be dispersed and the shelves will be restocked with stuff. Rise of altruism, but it's a conditional form of altruism. Um, it comes with ostracism or fear of healthcare workers. So people can get up and cheer at 7 p.m. every night for healthcare workers, but many of these people getting up and cheering are mortally terrified about coming into close contact with healthcare workers. And we've done some research on this, and this is of concern because Already burnout is a big problem for healthcare workers. If they're being stigmatized by people in their community, that just adds another layer of stress to them. So in our research um, published last year, it was a sample of a couple of thousand adults, uh, none of which were healthcare workers. Um, about a third of them had these distorted beliefs about healthcare workers. They thought healthcare workers were highly likely to be infected and they thought the healthcare workers should be um, segregated from the rest of community. Uh, these, ten, these people with these beliefs tend to be very anxious, which makes me wonder if you educated them and you treated their fears of COVID, then that might reduce their stigmatizing attitudes. Mask rebellion 2020 is nothing new. Um, they, there was an attempt to mandate masks in San Francisco in 1919 during the Spanish flu that led to the short-lived formation of the Anti-Mask League. The reasons back then are the same today. People believing masks were ineffective, uncomfortable, and they didn't like being forced to wear masks. This is something called psychological reactance. This is my son, Alex, back when he was three, he's now 16. Uh, he was the epitome of, of psychological reactance. I remember telling him one day to clean up his Legos. And he looked up at me and said, you're not the boss of me. And I looked down at him and I said, Listen, Mr. Monkey Mask, I am the boss of you. You go clean up your Legos. So psychological reactance is an alert reaction to being told what to do. It's a you're not the boss of me reaction. So you come up, let's say you go up to someone who's not wearing a mask on a bus and you start to get into a debate with them and you're trying to persuade them to wear a mask and they have a high level of psychological reactance. Two things will happen as you try to persuade them. They will become and they will generate reasons for justifying their position. So your attempt to confront them will backfire. And this is psychological reactance. So if we're going to address reactance, it needs a different kind of messaging nudges, for example. Um, conspiracy theories, nothing new here, folks. Um, though conspiracy theories are more prominent now than they were today. Disease outbreaks have always been subject to conspiracy theories. Zika, for example, part of a theory that was part of a plot by the New World Order, this fictitious shadowy organization to depopulate the planet so they can take over. SARS, SARS is a bioweapon, COVID, bioweapon, hoax to control the population caused by 5G towers. So these conspiracy theories, the COVID conspiracy theories are just recycled and reassembled conspiracy theories from the past. 1918.
sneaking into Manhattan at night via U-boats and spreading the disease. People who believe in these conspiracy theories, if you believe that um, COVID-19 is a hoax caused by a government wanting to control the population, you're also likely to believe that 9-11 was an inside job, that NASA faked the moon landings, and the government is hiding evidence of extraterrestrial contacts. So it's a conspiratorial mindset. Um, these people are suspicious, they're narcissistic, they have a lower media literacy and poor skills at analytical thinking, they tend to be anti-science. It's very difficult to persuade hardcore conspiracy theorists that they're wrong. In fact, if you engage them in, dis in debate, that will backfire too, because they will conclude that you are part of the conspiracy. So there are ways of challenging this, but it's very difficult. Um, you're familiar with the anti-vax issues. There are really two kinds of anti-vaxxers, to be put really simply. One of the people who are, who are long-standing anti-vax attitudes, again, difficult to persuade. The other group of people are the people who say, oh, this um, COVID vaccine is new. It doesn't have a track record. I'm going to wait and see what happens to everyone else. So that's the second group who will just stand offish. And with time, they will pick up on the vaccine. So they are not as of concern. Pandemic fatigue, and this is what we're currently in. If you look at graphs of people's mental health over 2020, um, anxiety levels popped up and down depending on um, the outbreak in communities, but depression progressively increased. So about a third of people are experiencing kind of a low grade funk. It's not clinical depression, it's kind of a low mood with irritability. And that's associated with progressive disregard for social distancing. Now, that the key challenge here is to motivate um, pandemic fatigue people to um, engage in social distancing. And if you're interested, there's a really nice paper written on this by WHO published last year. Public messaging is hugely important for uh, enhancing adherence. Um, I just want to give you some examples of how hugely important it is. Um, messages that are good, bad, and downright ugly. This is a good message for reaching people who dismiss the whole thing, who think it's no big deal. This is the personal narrative. And this was one example, a CNN interview with this guy who thought um, COVID-19 was no big deal till we went to a, an event. He got sick and he got 14 of his relatives sick and he suddenly saw the light and realized that this is serious. Those kind of news messages get people's attention for the people who think this is no big deal. Um, Contrast that with this, um, the message from health authorities that says stock up on a two week supply. That's a bad message because it precipitates panic buying. So we saw the good, the bad. Now this is the downright ugly. This was um, published a few weeks ago. I think it's since been taken down. The BC government in its wisdom decided to post a self care bingo card to provide people with ideas about how they could uh, cope with lockdown. This angered people. If you look at the options for self-care bingo, you could, you could play a board game, you could turn off devices, you could, you could do the sun salutation of yoga, you could make a blanket fort, or you could cry it out. Uh, people found this to be, as it says here, condescending, ableist, and insensitive. You need to really um, pilot test the messages. And this is why you need psychology, or one reason you need psychology in pandemics, to pilot test and construct messages that will, that will uh, address different people in different uh, demographic groups in the community. If you think young people are out partying too much and not taking this seriously, then you develop messages perhaps originated in a grassroots way by young people intended for young people. So this is why you need behavioral groups. And this refers to a British group, the Behavioral Insights Team, but we need those. Mental health consequences of SARS-CoV infection. Um, the WHO made this claim not long ago that um, uh, this pandemic will cause more mass trauma than World War II. I'm not sure how true that is, time will tell. But we do know that if you look at the rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, and this is just one example, um, the top bar shows that over 30% of people who are hospitalized with MERS or SARS develop PTSD, and that tends to be chronic. And similarly, 20, 30% of people with COVID hospitalized develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Now that's potentially serious. Resources, we've seen the rise of telehealth, um, 
There's been some military apps for enhancing resilience. I want to touch on in a second. So, you know, if, if you're wanting some advice about coping, I suggest you take a look at these apps. Cognitive behavior therapy can be useful for managing anxiety or depression or the bounce back um, site. Um, you can find this on the internet. That's a free cognitive behavioral program. The best program though, that I've seen so far, these are all um, reactive. They waited for the problem to arise. The best one was um, developed in Chengdu, which is the capital of Sichuan province. They set this up in February of 2020. This was proactive. They said, okay, city's going into lockdown. We're gonna have a major mental health problem. We'd better get prepared for it. So what they did, they had 26 mental health professionals and they set up on a shoestring budget. First off, a live media group, which provided um, televised programs to educate the public about um, mental health issues on how people might cope. There was a hotline where people could get advice. And if that wasn't enough, they were triaged to an online video intervention group and also an online crisis counseling group in hospitals. This was set up and on the, on the ball running in March of last year. Really amazing stuff. We should have been doing something similar. The military applications for enhancing the resilience of self of health care workers. Um, some of these, well, I want to zoom in. I don't have a lot of time here, but touch on something that's really important. They've been using here a buddy system, which has been used in the military. So if you go into the infantry, for example, in the United States, you're paired up with a buddy who's demographically similar to you and you debrief with your buddy. This simple and I think likely to be very effective system has been used with healthcare workers. So you get say um, two healthcare workers, it could be two physicians or two nurses, similar seniority, similar roles, and they, they meet up every day to debrief and gain mutual support. I think this is a great idea because um, as I say, the stress experienced by healthcare workers, frontline workers during this pandemic is phenomenal. So I'm gonna wrap up in the minutes remaining by talking about life in a post-pandemic world, and it's a kind of good news, bad news situation. The bad news, long-term problems. We know that um, post-traumatic stress disorder will be a long-term problem. We don't know how many people, uh, it won't be everyone, it will be a fraction of people who've been infected with COVID-19, but it's a problem that's treatable, but severe. OCD and germophobia are likely to arise during COVID and may become chronic for some people. Long COVID, as you know, these persistent symptoms, some of which look like chronic fatigue syndrome, although there are other things as well. And something I want to touch on that hasn't been picked up in the media yet, prolonged grief disorder. Now, for those of you who've lost loved ones, you know the old saying, you never get over it, you just kind of get used to it. Um, and so grief can last for about a year for most people, but in prolonged grief disorder, it becomes chronic. It's a severe depression-like grief reaction. Now I've just broken it down. Okay, so this disorder has a 10% prevalence and we know from research that one COVID death translates into about five bereaved close family members. So if you do the math, five bereaved close family members for each COVID death, and you multiply that through to the population of Canada, and you figure out 10%, that translates into about 11,000 cases of COVID related prolonged grief disorder in Canada. We don't have the resources to treat that. Our mental health system was broken before COVID-19. So this is gonna be really severe. And of course, a post pandemic economic recession is of concern. Now, um, recessions are associated characteristically with suicide, particularly among young working age males. And during the Russian flu pandemic and the Spanish flu pandemic, during the recessions, there was an increase in suicide. It's too early to tell whether there's a COVID related increase in suicide. There's no clear evidence yet, but if there's an economic recession after COVID-19 and the um, International Monetary Fund released last year, there's very doom and gloomy, scary reports suggesting that the post pandemic economic recession could be worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. I don't think that's true, at least I hope it's not true, um, but that could be very bad. Okay, enough bad stuff. So finish up with some good news. Um, so the question a lot of people ask, are we gonna move from this to this? Well, it's a no brainer, of course we are. Think about 1918. 
this closed. And think about what people were experiencing in 1918. If you were sick, you and your whole family were in quarantine in your home. Theatres, schools, places of congregation were closed. And the, the fear that some people experienced was palpable. Here's a quote from an historian that one person um, uh, provided. Uh, according to this person who lived through the Spanish flu, people were afraid to kiss one another, people were afraid to eat with one another, they were afraid to have anything that made contact because that's how you got the flu. It destroyed those contacts and destroyed the intimacy that existed amongst people. You were constantly afraid. You were afraid because you saw how much death around you, you were surrounded by death. Now, do you think you can bounce back from this and this? Well, yeah. 1921, here we go, the great, uh, the, um, the roaring 20s. And if you look at the crowd, there's not a mask to be seen. Wuhan all... Okay, last summer, look at the hordes. Spring Bake 2021, you know what. It illustrates how most people bounce back. Resilience is the norm. Not everyone does. Um, what are the psychological scars of post pandemics? Well, what happened to all the masks after 1918? And people bounce back. There may be a short term rebound of hyper sociability, a kind of so called roll, uh, roaring 20s scenario. And um, COVID 19 is probably here to stay, but if it's like the Russian flu, which incidentally was thought to be caused by the OC43 coronavirus, that apparently mutated into a virus that now is one of the coronaviruses causing the common cold. And that could be the fate of SARS-CoV-2. It, it probably will become endemic, but it may mutate into a milder variant. growth is not just bouncing back to where you were before the pandemic, but it's growing as a human being. And we have some data suggesting that uh, a good number of people are experiencing positive personal changes due to COVID. I mean, acknowledging that it's been bad, there've been many deaths, many sicknesses, but for many of our respondents, they're saying, well, yep, COVID's been bad, but they've developed a stronger appreciation for friends and family, greater compassion for others, feeling more resilient and a deepening spirituality. So that's, I guess there's some silver linings. So just to wrap it up, the future of pandemic mitigation, pandemics aren't about some microbe going viral. We need more psychology in the, in the management of pandemics. And we've seen this now where, um, in, let's say, take Ontario, where the uh, recommendation was to close golf courses, um, which made no sense. So, uh, and that messaging, that uncertain messaging um, caused people to doubt their, the, the uh, political leaders. And if you doubt your leaders, you're not gonna follow their advice. So we need more messaging um, psychology in terms of managing pandemics, managing the messaging, and we need more of that Chengdu style psychology, proactive rather than reactive. Yeah, so, so with that, I'm, I'm gonna stop there and open it up for questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I will just go into the uh, the Slido questions right now, Dr. Taylor. Um, okay. So um, are you able to see the screen? So the first question, um, you touched on vaccine hesitancy. The first question is someone who would like you to speak a bit more on the psychology of vaccine adoption, basically some tips to convince a hesitant family and friends what would be helpful. Okay, uh, I cut out there, but I think I got the question. Um, it really depends. You understand vaccination. Sorry, Dr. Taylor, you're cutting out. So maybe if you um, just go into... Um, did I freeze again? Yes, yes, sorry. sorry. Maybe... This internet connection is driving me mad. Um, I think too many people in my building are watching Netflix right now. Uh, <laughs> it, it sucks the bandwidth. Um, 
vaccination hesitancy. You need to understand why the person is hesitant toward vaccination. Uh, it could be all kinds of reasons. If you understand the reasons, you're in a better position for um, educating them or persuading them, if you like. So if the person is, like many people say, oh, I worry about the safety and durability of the vaccine, for those people, it might just be give it a few months and they will, they will take up the vaccine once they see that everyone else is safe. Um, but, you know, you really need to... to speak to why the person is not getting vaccinated. Do they think that COVID is no big deal? And you could talk with them about that. Or do they harbor conspiracy theories? For example, some people adhere to the conspiracy theory that um, COVID-19 is part of a conspiracy by big pharma to um, make lots of money. So if a person adheres to that conspiracy theory, you know, people with a hardcore conspiratorial mindset um, it's like trying to argue with someone who's delusional. Um, the harder you try to argue with them, the stronger their conviction becomes. So for those kinds of individuals, particularly if there's a family member, the best outcome you could get would be, say, agreeing to disagree. Thank you. Um, next question. Has the pandemic affected the psychology between our personal decision making? If there was no pandemic, would we have made different decisions in the past year? They, they don't elaborate anymore. So that's, that's very general. Uh, interesting. Um, this pandemic seems to have um, served as a catalyst, accelerating social trends that were already in place from last from 2019. For example, accelerating the trends to work from home rather than going into the office, to watch movies uh, at home rather than going to cinemas, to dine at home rather than you know, through you know, food delivery services, rather than go out to a restaurant. So it, it's accelerated those things that are already in place. So in that sense, it can influence people's decision making in that they'll be more likely to stay home. That said, however, you know, most people can't, we've done, been doing survey research, most people can't wait to bounce back and get back and even go to large stadium concerts or, or football games and so forth, because people are inherently social creatures um, and managing pandemics requires us to suppress that urge to be sociable. So getting back to this, this question, will it impact in our decision making? Well, I would expect, yeah, it will influence people's decisions. Oh, do I want to work from home or go into the office? Uh, it will influence people's decisions about travel. Uh, is it safe to travel? I think at least for the next little while, safety is going to be an issue in people's minds, influencing their decisions, uh, for example, around interpersonal uh, international travel. Okay, thank you. I just want to say to everyone else, we still have about 10 more minutes for questions. So if you would like to go into Slido and just put in the code one hour, all caps, um, 0422, then you can put in your questions. Um, the next question here is, are we really feeling different than they did in Athens? Now we have vaccine envy as well for our friends who do not live in Canada. Awesome. Can I put up a... Oh, I already put up that slide, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, the plague of Athens. Um, yes. Uh, are we really feeling any different than I did in Athens? Uh, yeah, we are. Um, they felt that there was nothing they can do. There was this inherent sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Um, if you read the descriptions, they were saying that the physicians were all helpless and hopeless. They had no idea how the plague was being spread. If it was typhus, it was probably from fleas, um, from uh, rats coming in, um, from um, being brought aboard in ports. Um, they had hopeless, helpless, there was nothing they could do. They tried placating the gods, making offerings. They tried consulting the oracles. They tried their medical experts. There was nothing they could do. They realized if they went off and tried to nurse their friends and family, there was a good chance that they could die as well. So people were dying neglected. It got to a point where there were descriptions that even the animals and birds that fed on carrion wouldn't touch the corpses in this pandemic. Uh, or if they did, there's descriptions of birds coming in and pecking on the corpses because there were plenty of corpses littering the, the, the towns. Uh, the birds dying. So yeah, we're really different from Athens back then. When we're in lockdown, um, we don't die of neglect in mm -hmm. general. 
Um, we don't see corpses. In fact, you know, this is very different from um, even the Spanish flu. Um, the site of funerals and, and coffins was a daily event back then. We hardly ever see that um, now. So we are really different. And this might have to do uh, tie in with this disregard syndrome. Um, for many people, the, the pandemic is an abstract phenomenon that they read about on the internet. They, they read about it happening somewhere else, but they, they don't see corpses or coffins in the day room. And that can give it a, um, an unreal feeling. So you've got that and you've got all the tools that we have um, now for keeping ourselves safe. Back then in Athens, they didn't know how to keep themselves safe. They didn't know what to do. They, they realized if, if you came in contact with someone who was sick, you could get it as well, but they didn't know that the, the vector or mechanism. Now we have germ theory. And so we know that there are things we can do, hygiene theater, masks, vaccinations, that will keep ourselves safe. So our world is more predictable and controllable than it was in Athens. And so um, that predictability and uncontrollability, uh, predictability and controllability can make it easier for us to manage that stress. Thank you. Um, next question. Is the psychology for children living through a pandemic any different than for adults? Really good question. It may be. It's too early to tell at this point. We know that kids are resilient, but then again, there's a question. What happens if, you, um, if children are afflicted by an event You've, you've just frozen again. Perhaps if you turn off your video and just have the audio. Okay, sorry, I'm back. It, yeah. I froze for a second. It's too early to say. Um, I know that many children are finding schooling to be boring and stressful, and they're worrying not so much about getting infected, but worrying about their grades. Uh, and they're missing out on developmental uh, milestones, rituals, going to graduation parties. Um, things like that. And for a lot of kids, it's this overwhelming feeling of boredom during this pandemic. Um, as for whether it will affect children different from older adults, we don't know at this point, time will tell. Okay, thank you. Our next question, how do you understand the low uptake of vaccines among care home workers once they are offered? This seems to be an issue nationwide. It's interesting, it's not just home workers, it's also the military uh, in the United States in particular who've been uh, ref refusing vaccines. Um, the refusal of, of home workers or care workers to get vaccinated is a longstanding problem. It's not a new problem. In fact, vaccination hesitancy among healthcare workers um, in the 2000s, it seemed to be, if anything, getting a bit worse. And if you go back to, say, the, the um, 2009 H1N1, the so-called swine flu pandemic, roughly 50% of the community didn't bother to get vaccinated. And it was also a problem with healthcare workers. Um, the reasons they gave back then were the same reasons that the rest of the community gave. They didn't think the vaccine was, was useful or necessary, and they thought that the the risks outweigh the benefits. So I don't know if this is the case with care workers today, but I think it probably is that they're refusing the vaccine for the same reasons as, as the other vaccination hesitant people. Okay, thank you. Um, you've got about four minutes left, so I'll, I'll see if we can get through one, maybe two questions. Um, what can you do now in the third wave to increase your psychological and physical resilience for the possible fourth wave of double or triple mutant variants. Okay, There's, there are a, a number of things you can do. One is to um, be very conscientious about managing the, your own stress in your life. I know people were into stress management and things like exercise, setting a schedule, healthy eating, getting a, um, having a, a good sleep-wake schedule early on in 2020 and people slackened off. Um, as the pandemic dragged out. So interestingly, you look at data from the United States, people got fatter and fatter over 2020. Whereas if you go to somewhere like Bangladesh, of course, it was the opposite, people starving because they couldn't work. Um, so improving resilience now 
it involves getting back, going back and doing all those sorts of stress management things that you did before, making sure you do that to try and tough out this next period. Um, taking it on a day by day level, working on your intolerance for uncertainty. Um, and if that's not working, make sure you, you um, tie to your dose of news media. If you're spending all day getting news media, that's probably not good for you. It's just going to stress you out. Obviously, we all need to be informed, but um, uh, limit your dose. You know, don't do six hours a day, that sort of thing, reaching out to friends and family. If that doesn't work, I'd suggest that you consult some of these apps or um, uh, um, web programs. Importantly, we're all going to have to find ways of improving our tolerance for uncertainty, because here's something that most people don't understand at this point. Um, I think many people have this implicit view that one day we'll wake up later this year and the sun will be shining and the WHO will announce COVID is gone. Yay, the pandemic is over. That's not how it's going to happen. COVID is here to stay and it will probably become endemic. So what will happen is one day you'll wake up and the WHO will say, well, we've flattened the curve enough. The rate of infection is low enough. We're going to say the pandemic is over and open up the economy. That's how it's going to happen. That will be our post-pandemic world, and it will be called a post-pandemic period. So you're going to be going out to streets. You'll find everything opened up, but there'll be still people in your community getting sick and dying, but at a lower level. So we're going to have to wrap our heads around that uh, unusual situation where we're going back and we're socialising, but there's still infection out there. So we're going to have to work on our tolerance for uncertainty because you're not going to know whether a person you're interacting with is an asymptomatic carrier or not. So that, that's the next challenge ahead. Thank you. I think um, on, on that note, we'll have to wrap up. I know you have a, another engagement in the next few minutes. So thank you very much, Dr. Taylor, for your time. Um, a lot of information and, and that you've provided in a very short time, but it's really given us a lot to think about. So thank you very much for our time. And for everyone else, we have one more lecture on April 29th and there's still more uh, spots available if you wish to register for that session. Thank you very much everyone for joining us this afternoon and stay safe and stay healthy and uh, get out and enjoy the, the sunshine and the UV rays. Have a, have a good day, thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for the great questions and comments.